Good morning, Clemson. How y'all doing today? Or how y'all y'all doing today? <laughs> That's how we say it up in North Dakota. My name is Pete Haga. I am the, uh, the president-elect for ITGA. I'm here on behalf of Jim Fitzgerald, the president of ITGA. Um, Jim can't be with us today, uh, but uh, he's here in spirit. Um, we've had the pleasure of working with Jim for the last last year or so, and his passion for ITGA is absolutely astounding. It uh, inspires us all. Um, he's so proud of, uh, of everything we've been able to build here, and he was so looking forward to being here in Clemson, so um, I know that he, he is really here with us. Um, we have a card for him uh, that we'd like to send off to him out in the lobby, and I'd really like to strongly encourage, if you could, please, uh, take some time and just write a little note to Jim and say how much, um, how much we appreciate uh, his work on, on making all this happen. Um, so on behalf of uh, um, President Jim Fitzgerald, uh, welcome. It's good to be home in Clemson. I forgot something. You might have noticed the purple. Is that the right color? It's close, right? <laughs> it is good to be home in Clemson. <laughs> Many of you know, uh, many of you may not know, this is where it all started. Uh, we are so proud to be back here. Um, you may know the uh, conference program is called Back to the Future. That's why we're back in Clemson. This is where it all started, all the inspiration. A special nod to uh, uh, Mary, uh, Mayor um, uh, Larry Abernathy, who's, who's pictured here, um, the mayor that really got things started, um, and really to all the folks in, in, in Clemson. Let me do a quick note, um, a really huge thank you to uh, Michelle Gottfried and Steve Robbins, who are conference hosts who are probably out running around doing something right now, but if you see them, please, a, a little. A huge thank you to the whole city of Clemson, the Univer uh, Clemson University, for all that they have done over the last year, all they've um, been continuing to be doing. Um, your legacy is secure here, Clemson. Um, you've done a wonderful job. Um, ITGA is strong and growing stronger, and it's all, all because of you, and it's all because of you in the room. Um, let me also take this opportunity to thank Beth Bagwell. Beth, I know she doesn't like to be um, introduced, and that's why I do it. <laughs> um, she's really the inner workings of ITGA, everything that actually really happens. Um, she's responsible for that. It's amazing. Um, if somebody can get her to stop sending emails at 3 a.m., it'd be fantastic. <laughs> thank you, Beth, for everything you do. Quite amazing. You know, we're all here um, because we believe in the power of relationships we, uh, between our universities, between our communities, and how important they are. We're here because we love the communities in which we live and the universities that define us. Uh, where else and what other conference in ITGA uh, can we have university presidents and vice presidents, mayors and council members, um, student, student affairs officials, PR officials, uh, city staff like myself, um, all coming together, gathered in the same place, learn from each other, help each other, and focus on our relationships with town and gown. You know, I think we're at a special time in this country right now where, um, where uh, you look at the federal government, you look at the state government, really where things are happening, the exciting things happening are right in our communities right now. In particular, they're happening in our university communities. Uh, more than ever, our future uh, as a nation is being forged and developed at a local level. Um, it is happening by the investments and the innovations in communities throughout the nations. And more, like I said, more than ever, uh, those investments, those innovations are taking place in university communities. It's how we build our people, uh, the character that we define in, in our students, our future leaders, and the relationships that we build. That's, that's really what our future is for our country. Um, and you thank you all for being here, are all on the ground floor of that. Every day you're working to make sure that our students, our community members are, are getting the best, that they're inspired, that they're becoming the type of people that, that we know they can be, that they'll be the leaders um, of tomorrow, that our, our communities uh, with our universities are our engines of, of development, of economic development, community development, and the types of things that is gonna continue to um, keep our, our nation strong. So I wanna thank you all for being here. Um, it's the the largest crowd I think we've ever had gathered. Is that right, Beth? For ITGA, so give yourself a hand one more time. I keep you clapping just to keep you awake, right? If the orange can't do it. Uh, it is now, um, we're a little bit behind. 
It is now um, my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce our opening and keynote speaker. Um, I'll try to get out of your way as quick as I can, but um, this deserves a couple of words. Uh, Jim Hunt speaks, trains, and writes on leadership development in local government and assisting communities in maximizing their potential. He is the founder of Amazing Cities, an organization dedicated to creating excellent and municipal government. Jim served in elected local office for 27 years and has played a prominent role on a state, national, and international level in advancing the cause of effective local governance. In 2006, American City and County Magazine named Jim as Municipal Leader of the Year. During his tenure as president of the National League of Cities, the oldest and largest organization representing municipal governments, Jim traveled throughout the United States speaking to over 25,000 local municipal officers on excellence in local government. Jim writes on issues important to local government and is the co-author of Bottom Line Green, How America's Cities Are Saving the Planet and Money Too. Jim is probably best known for creating the Partnership for Inclusive Communities, a national effort to create an inclusive approach to government. Jim has appeared on C-SPAN, NPR, and is regularly quoted in national media outlets on issues concerning local government. He has also been a contributor to National Public Radio's All Things Considered program. About a decade ago or so, I think, right? I found myself in a room similar to this, probably sitting way near the back because I just came in. Um, no offense to somebody who just came in. <laughs> uh, and so I could sneak out if the speaker was driving me to speak out. But it was a room much like this and a conversation erupted about universities and communities. And it's really the first time I had heard about the importance of universities and communities. We all love, love each other, right? But we really don't talk a lot about that. Um, we didn't back then. It didn't feel like we did back then. And uh, there was this guy, this big gregarious guy who was just excited, pumped up about how universities can work with cities better, how we can learn from each other, how we can develop those relationships that will really do something important, not just for our, ourselves, but for our future generations. Um, and that guy was Jim Hunt. I, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting him. I had the pleasure of um, um, being inspired by him. I have to acknowledge it's his fault that I'm standing in front of you taking up your time here this morning. I would not be here if I was not so inspired, um, so moved, and uh, following the leadership of Jim over the last several years, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome to you Mr. Jim Hunt. That's great. I don't see another sweater underneath the table, so I'm not going to duck down and change. Uh, this is really a pleasure for me, and uh, one of the things that I started to think about as to what message would be the best message today is really kind of a conversation uh, with you about uh, town-gown relations. Uh, I want to first off, and I think uh, probably as effective as anything, is really thanking uh, the city of Clemson, and I spoke to the Mayor Cook last night, um, and as Pete had mentioned, Mayor Abernathy, uh, the city of Clemson is really an example to take home to your communities of what a community can do uh, to form a better town-gown relationship. And when former Mayor Abernathy, you, you kind of look at the core of what people does in terms of town-gown relations, and he was quoted as saying that he wanted to make from the landscaping in the city and the university, he wanted to make it invisible where the city ended and Clemson University began. And I think that says a lot about an individual that would really feel this is what makes it work. And then when we look at Clemson University, and this is my first visit to Clemson, South Carolina and to Clemson University, and just in that short drive around town and, and looking at what is here, uh, it makes me feel like I wish I would have known this earlier in life. What a beautiful place to come, as we all come from a lot of nice places. But as you drive around, you sense that it is something special uh, in Clemson. And I would recognize that the new president of Clemson University, Jim Clements, uh, formerly was the president of West Virginia University, my alma mater, prior to coming to Clemson. And I, I say this as a mountaineer and someone who really loves West Virginia, uh, but driving around Clemson, I see why Jim Clements saw something here that really he wanted to invest his life and efforts in. 
And then when we look at ITGA and Beth and the staff and what they've been able to do, uh, and Pete touched on it, but I think it's worth mentioning because we probably have some folks that are here uh, because they look at the International Town Gown Association and they say, oh, that's that organization that's been around for, oh, probably a hundred years because it's so valuable uh, of what we all do. And we recognize it's a relatively short history. And it really is to the credit of Clemson and the city of Clemson of how it was formed and, and initially funded and nursed along and made into the organization that all of the folks in this room have come today to learn. And then, um, you know, when we start to think about this, we recognize that the value of this is not necessarily just the folks in this room, but it's all of those people out there that could benefit from effective town-gown relationships that aren't in the room. And as you talk to almost any group, um, Fortunately or unfortunately, the people that are in this room are probably the ones in the country that least need this message. I mean, you all get it to some degree. You all understand the value of a town-gown relationship, and you've chosen to say, you know, I'm going to go down to South Carolina in the uh, summer and probably be a little uh, warm down there, but I'm going to come down and set through meetings to learn how to improve town-gown relations. And that is really the topic, and I use this in a lot of what I do, but from great to amazing. And as it started years ago, when you'd ask city officials, how's their town doing, virtually every city official in America tells you, oh, we're doing great. And I'd always say, you know, you know because you can read the papers, and now you can Google of folks and find out what challenges people has. But when you look at that, you say, you know, everybody's doing great, but I truly think that we can take it from great to amazing. And if there's folks in this room, and I've spoke to a couple, young lady from Bowling Green, and, and I had breakfast this morning with uh, Bob Hall from Northern Virginia Community College, we recognize that a lot of great things are happening across the country. But we start to wonder, can it be better? And I'd like to kind of lay out some ideas for you today that I think will be of value in, in moving things along. And, and let me tell you a little bit about myself, and it's one of the things that, um, and I'll tell you a short story to kind of indicate is that through my whole life, about the time when I, I really feel great that I've really done something uh, to, of accomplishment, I always get brought down a little bit. So I'm, I'm, I stay pretty humble in my life. And coming from West Virginia, I'm a native from West Virginia, and I've had some experiences in my life that have just been fantastic. And so a lot of times, you know, it's, you do that and you tend to get a little big-headed and you start thinking, man, I'm really important. But I had an experience when I was, Pete has mentioned, I was elected president of the National League of Cities in 2006. And when that happened, uh, previously when I knew the presidents of the National League of Cities, they were the mayor of Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Detroit, Atlanta, all these large cities. And I was just so fortunate that I became the president of the National League of Cities. So when it happened, they actually sent me to a, a media consultant because not that I don't think they were worried, but they wanted to really brush me up and make me effective if I was interviewed and so forth. And I, I asked, I said, well, what's this involved? And they said, well, we're going to bring a fella in who coaches people before they're going on 60 Minutes. And he's going to work with you and spend the day with you, and then you'll be a little better prepared in interviews and when the press calls and so forth. So I started, so I went to Washington, and they taught me how to handle the, the media and what to say and what not to say and so forth. So at that time, like many city officials, most city officials, in fact, across the country, I had a day job. I was working for the West Virginia Housing Development Fund, and uh, manage the field office in my hometown. So my administrative assistant, she was reading in the papers that I was elected president of the National League of Cities, and I'm heading off to Washington to do these trainings and so forth. And uh, so we sat down one day, and I wanted to make sure that she was kind of on track and understood what was going to happen on this journey of a year of, of, of being president of the National League of Cities. So I explained to her, I said, don't get nervous, but I said, you know, there's going to be some phone calls coming to the office for me that'll be coming from who knows who. 
It could be reporters from some national publication, could be a television show that wants to do a little thing, and so I was kind of pretty proud then that I was getting to do all this. So as, and I told her, I said, now, you know, we have to balance this because I have a job that uh, they were very concerned about how much time I was going to be spending traveling around doing all this. But I said, I want you to be very uh, uh, aware that if someone does call, if I'm in a meeting or something, to please let me know, um, uh, to, you know, interrupt and, and let me know what's happening. So not just a few uh, days later, I was in my office and I had a few folks in my office at a meeting and they were sitting there and uh, the door was closed and we were talking about housing issues and my administrative assistant came to the door, knocked on the door, said, uh, Jim, uh, didn't know whether to bother you, but the Wall Street Journal is on the phone. Now, the folks in the room with me, they, they'd read in the paper, the local paper, all Jim's this thing, and they, they were, I mean, it, you could have saw the look on their faces. They're like, my goodness, is this guy important? So I thought to myself, I thought, should I leave the room and go take the call, or do I do the thing? And I said, you know, just hold on a second. I have this important call. And I, so I thought, you know, I'm kind of getting a little bit inflated with all this attention. I said, go ahead and put the call through to me. And I said, if you'll excuse me for one minute. I could see their eyes were just opening up. So I picked my phone up and I held it up and I said, hello, Jim Hunt, President, National League of Cities. And the person on the other end said, hi, this is Bobby of the Wall Street Journal. We're having a special. <laughs> so I had a, my first ethical dilemma in, <laughs> as President of National League of Cities. Should I say oops or should so I said uh, sir uh, you're just going to have to call later I'm in a very important meeting <laughs> with my colleagues I will call you back and I hang the, hung the phone up <laughs> but some of the unique experiences and I, I've truly been blessed but I, I've had some unique experience I served 27 years as Pete mentioned in local government as the mayor and council member in Clarksburg West Virginia my hometown and that gave me an education like none other. Um, I also worked for the State Housing Finance Agency and in that role worked on uh, housing issues throughout West Virginia and in communities with universities and colleges and those without. Uh, at, toward the end of my career, I was uh, uh, led the Sunnyside Up organization, which was a campus uh, neighborhoods revitalization effort, a nonprofit in Morgantown, West Virginia, and it was jointly funded by the university and the city, and really one of those town gown relationships that was beneficial from the standpoint it was well funded. It had a good mission to work with both sides, and neither side was dominant. It was equally funded by both the university and the city. So I, when I describe that, and now I'm a speaker and a consultant across the country, and, and I tell you that because I think I have a wide variety of background and experience. Uh, my mother tells people that her son can't keep a job, so. Uh, but I started to think, what, what is the valuable message? What can you take today that you can take home with you that you'll say this was a worthwhile session to get up at 8 o'clock and, and kind of start thinking a little bit about the town-gown relationships? And in some cases, and I'm sure there's people sitting in this room that says, what city official would object to having a better town-gown relationship? We see the value of this. Why would there be any issues about why we couldn't have a great town-gown relationship in our community? The benefits seem to just be totally uh, all on the plus side and really none on the negative side. And let me give you just an overview from the city officials' perspective. There are issues that tend in almost every community to create some natural obstacles for town-gown relationships. Uh, one of those, and I, I could ask in the audience, and I'm sure you'll come up with many of the same list that I'll give, but I won't embarrass anybody by asking, but student behavior uh, creeps up high on that list. And student behavior in our communities, and a lot of times people say, well, but we handle that internally in the university. We kind of keep 
keep that controlled, and so really the city officials, they never get any fallout from that. But student behavior creates an awful lot of uh, issues in our communities. And it really gets the local populace reared up against this good town-gown relationships. And when you have that city council person or the mayor in their office after a weekend and there's been some incident somewhere throughout the community and they get those phone calls, that's not the day to schedule the town gown, let's come together relationship because it is a difficult challenge in many communities. The other thing that is becoming more and more of an issue is the declining, shrinking tax base in cities across the country. And when we look across the country, cities are under attack both on the federal, the state, and the local level. So revenues that used to be there, and in many cases, when you hosted a university or a college in your town, it always seemed to put you up a, a notch on the, on the level, is that in some cases today, citizens and city officials perceive that we're losing ground and in some cases that kind of the ugly head that comes up and says it's because the university has all this tax-exempt property. It's because they're buying up local businesses and local commercial property to put university facilities on. So there again, that's a natural one that comes up. It's unfair, but it's still a, a natural one that comes up in many communities. Another one that kind of relates to student behavior, but it's the disruption in neighborhoods. That when you look around the country, uh, neighborhoods are impacted, and in many ways we could all say positively and negatively by activities of your local university or town. But in a lot of neighbors' consideration, it's only negative. They look at it from the standpoint that our neighborhoods are changing, that we're getting an influx of student housing, we're having the, um, you know, one house on a block is starting to really create some problems and that's causing other folks to want to sell out and so forth. So that's another one that people perceive. They don't see the good side of it and say, hey, a lot of these neighborhoods wouldn't exist without the university or the college, but they start to see that, man, live, what could I protest about, in a lot of cases, it's that daggone university coming into our neighborhoods disrupting the kind of peaceable life uh, that we have, you know, that, of the good old days, I guess you'd term. And another is, um, and this is one that comes up, uh, conflicts uh, with the code departments, the building departments, local landlords that are frustrated with the city code department. Um, you know, when you try and set up this template for the entire city and you start to realize that in many cases there are these natural kind of rubbing spots that do just doesn't work. So, and I noted on the attendees list, there's several city planning staff that are in the audience today. And it's a, you know, I don't envy your jobs because what you know, you get a group of people coming in with the best idea in the world, you get another group that you're the worst person that ever represented the city in your life. So those type of issues also create that conflict. Now, without asking for any uh, uh, real outpouring, but has that captured some of those issues that are in your towns across the country? If, if I've missed any, ra raise your hand if those seem to capture some of those issues that affect us all. And, and I've dealt with almost every one of them. Uh, there's not easy answers to it. I think the, when the university is succeeding, in many cases it creates, you'd think, well, man, everything's looking great. Uh, the university's growing. They're announcing new building plans. We've got new enrollment figures that are higher than ever before. Wouldn't the city just be tickled to death that we're having all this great work? So, generally, that's not the case. The other part is, is that when the universities, if they're struggling with budget cuts and they have to start thinking now we're going to have to be doing things in a different way, you'd also think, well, that ought to satisfy all the neighbors and everyone because they'll say, you know, it's getting back to the good old days. And it truly isn't. That's when challenges occur. There's times in terms of community policing where when the university is doing well, uh, the 
uh, police services and they're able to fund an awful lot of the things that occur in a community where they have an impact when things are not doing well and they cut back on security and other things that puts an additional uh, uh, responsibility onto the city and really creates that kind of dynamic chaos if you will that that affects uh, town gown relationships so when we look at that and we kind of set that uh, set the lay of the land, let me observe something else uh, that I've found and it's kind of unique to be able to, uh, I've uh, come in years past when I was with uh, the Morgantown Initiative, the nonprofit, I'd come to international town gown meetings back to Ames, Iowa and Boulder, Colorado and Richmond, Kentucky and I'd be there and I'd start looking around and I didn't see very many of my colleagues that I would interact with nationally uh, with the National League of Cities and other organizations. And I started to wonder, I thought, geez, I think as Pete has discovered and other folks have discovered, this is one of the jewels. This is one of the solutions where we can create better town gown relations. Why is there not a ton of elected officials in the room? And I'll try and answer that a little bit because I think it gives maybe a hint at what might be a solution for better town gown relations is that when you do look around and you see um, that a lot of city officials that are affiliated that come to these meetings with International Town Gown, in many cases they're affiliated with the university or college in some fashion. They have been drawn out because they have those unique skills. They said, hey, you're a, a former elected official or you are an elected official. Would you like to you know, go and represent us at the International Town Gown meeting? Would you guys like to go learn? But to actually get that typical person that says, I'm a local elected official, I have no affiliation with the university, uh, and I'd just like to go learn how to have better town gown relations, um, where are they? And they aren't generally in this room. And that's not an indictment of local officials by any means. But what it does say is that there's some little combination that we need to figure out that when this room is almost half and half, when you're able to sit at a table and talk about truly the issues that happen in communities, because we gloss over so much when we're sitting at chamber banquets and everything's great. But to get it to amazing, we do have to face the facts that, that there's going to be times when there's conflict. There's going to be times when we're not all on the same page. But when we look at the mission of having better town gown relations, that's the key. That there's going to be those times that are rough and rocky, but when we can overcome that and get to a better overall town gown relationship, it's going to work for all of us. And I'll go a little bit deeper into this in the breakout session this afternoon, but I want to touch on four points and just give you a little example and, and I do this in the perspective um, of what impacts the city official to some degree. In the, and it's the four C's, um, the first C is convening. And we tend to think, when I travel around and I ask folks, what's the state of your town gown relationships? And when people goes back, to, you'll ask them, when was the last time you sat down? And a lot of times they start scratching their heads and they say, well, that was when that big neighborhood dust up happened when we had the, you know, the house over on 15th Street where they were burning stuff at night and everybody came to the council meeting and the university sent a few folks. That was our last town gown interaction. And when you do that, it creates that kind of feeling that the only time the town and the gown gets together is around problems. So when I say convening, it's a little bit of that idea of inviting folks to the table, of looking at events that the university is doing, uh, looking at events the city is doing, that are not linked together, but are good opportunities to bring folks together and to use as a resource. That it's not talking about a specific university problem, but it might be talking about just a community problem, building better neighborhoods. And when we can start to share without there being this overriding black cloud in the room that says, oh my gosh, we all know why we're here. We're here because of what happened downtown on Saturday night. 
When we get away from that and start convening for the benefit of the community, um, it really goes a long way. Uh, city officials, and sometimes when you look at it, and as a person for 27 years that answered the phone uh, in my little town for complaints about dogs barking and buildings being built and all the different things that have occurred, you start to recognize that local officials have more on their table than the health and well-being of a town-gown relationship. And in many cases, in most communities across the country, the voting bloc that puts the city officials in office, it may come as a surprise to some folks, is not the university or the university students and so forth. So when they go to the grocery store and someone is complaining to them or talking to them, very rarely is it a young student that says, Mayor, I wanted to tell you how happy I am to come from downstate up to your community and I want to be a positive influence in our town. That, I, that hasn't happened yet. But the reality of it is, is you're going to hear all of the challenges, the complaints that folks have about the university or the college in town. And believe you me, as a person who survived eight elections in my hometown, if I tell people that you've got it all wrong, you don't understand what a value the university is in this community and how much you ought to just be thanking those kids that live next door to you, if you think that that gets you elected, you're wrong. So in many cases, when city officials are out, they have this kind of a natural conflict because what they hear are generally the, the points where there's a challenge in the community. So when I talk about convening, I start talking about, and I throw out just ideas. These are not unique. They don't work in every occasion or every instance. Um, but ask yourself the question, um, city councils and, and city administrations and so forth, one of the things that, and I'm sure Pete will agree with me, is that you, it's very difficult to leave the comfort of your city hall uh, because you're the king there. In a lot of cases, you go two blocks away and you're, you're not the, the greatest person that ever lived anywhere and all you're getting is these complaints. But in a lot of cases we miss opportunities that the city can outreach into the community and especially into the university or college in your town. Uh, hosting a city council meeting that is not around an issue that's of frustration in the community uh, on campus is one that is a win-win for everyone. When you have the mayor and the council interacting, they're sitting there, they're doing city business, they're not dealing with a, a university or, or a college issue, but it's the fact that the classes are invited to attend. Uh, folks on campus are there maybe for their first city council meeting in history. So when that happens, you start to recognize that really the importance of that is after the meeting, is before the meeting, is kind of giving uh, you know, some, uh, a little presentation on what good is happening at the university. And in many cases, that'll be that first good news that the city officials have has had. And when the university and, and the city comes together, those news articles, the public relations, the television, and so forth, really benefits in that positive PR. And I, you know, and like I said, maybe the folks in this room would not be a good test audience, and maybe you all are doing that, but I can almost guarantee you when you get called that, but I can almost guarantee challenging town gown relations, and you say, when was the last time you hosted such a meeting? Their eyes go blank. They, they say, we've never done that, and, and it's a good idea, but it's probably the wrong time to do it now, you know. So convening is one that I point out to you is just an always a good idea. Um, and in that way, if there is an issue, you put a face with a name. You're able to say that, uh, geez, uh, Council Member Smith uh, was on campus and understands the problems with uh, litter and trash and some other things that may otherwise they wouldn't uh, know. The other C is collaborate. Now sometimes people confuse and they'll say, well, we convene, so we're collaborating. But when I talk about collaboration, um, cities today are being, I mean, the stresses on budgets are just unbelievable, much like they are in universities and colleges across the country. 
But in most cases, as governments work, sometimes they give not a free pass, but they look at higher education sometimes. They'll say, well, you know, we can't cut out the future of the country, but we sure can cut the city's allocation of police funds and of public works and road funds and things like this. So when it comes in from the city's perspective, they're getting hit pretty hard. Now, where does that fit in with a university or college in the town? Is that really you all offer a resource to the city that it's not good or bad, it's good or none. That if you're able to provide a service, if you're able to provide some activity, some collaboration, this is a service that the city has no other way of paying for. So if you're doing some planning, if you're doing some, um, uh, and one thing that I, I find, and I, I tell folks as I travel around the country, if you're in a town that does not have a good public art feel that people can drive down your streets and say, you know what, we really get public art. The cities that have accomplished public art are doing so much better than cities that seem like, well, that's just not important. Our budgets are tough and we can't do it. And when you start to think that there's an asset that the university and college has, and it's also, when you look at the win-win side of it, the city gets something that they can't get anywhere else. They get kind of the art look in their town it comes via the students getting to explore and be out in town, being a little bit, you know, they can kind of open their minds and do some stuff that they may have not otherwise done, but they're all thinking about this. There's not a kid today that's in an art program at one of your schools that is not thinking, geez, I want to put my work out. I want to be a part of the community. And when that occurs, you start getting a benefit that the city sees it, the collaboration in that uh, manner really starts to gel the relationships. It starts to work on these person-to-person -person relationships where people feel like, you know what, the university just provided us $50,000 of public art that we could not have afforded in any other way. There's no budget in cities today for public art. You all have the resources and the young people out there that would say, you know what, I'd love to do that and put that on display. When that happens, I guarantee you, your town gown relationships improve. So when I talk about collaboration, and, and this has to be, it can't be just the president of the college university, the administrative staff, it has to be a culture that's developed. And I think in a lot of places where people says we have a great town gown relationship, it's because it's starting to filter out that there's things going on that the administration really doesn't even know about. There's classes that are outreaching into the community that just becomes a natural part of the way you do business. So when you start to think in terms of those relationships, the more that you can do on that, the more folks that you can bring to the table and just brainstorm and say, what is it that the city is in need of? Can we provide some finance people to do some work with the city? And you'd be shocked at knowing that you all provide one of the most, you have more resources to bring to the city than the state does in many communities. Because the states and the federal government has cut off most funding. When you're able to go in and say, and, and I'm sure not too many in this room has this situation, but there are cities across the country that uh, have no websites. And does that shock anyone? I mean, you, know, you look at it, there's 18,000 cities, towns, and villages in America. And we only point sometimes to the best of the best. But when we recognize that there are just unbelievable amounts of communities, and given that a lot of people now are working digitally and can work across uh, great distances, that town-gown relationship can kind of spread out into adjoining towns and bring that university flavor into a community that might otherwise not have touched it. And when you start putting together a little report of all of the ways that, that, that you've gone out into the communities, it's kind of hard to argue about good town-gown relationships when everyone is doing it and there's this kind of cross-collaboration that's happening. 
Um, the other C, the next C, is communicate. Now, you know, virtually every consultant in America, if they took the, the, the poor communication of their clients uh, as a issue, they would all go out of business because everyone uses that. They say, well, we don't communicate enough, and no one communicates enough. But the reality of it is, is when I talk about communication between the city and the uh, university or college in your town, is a communication, and as a local city official, you'd just be shocked at the amount of times where something is happening in town, and you are the last person to find it out. And when something happens of note, the university's breaking ground on the new athletic center, and you're at the grocery store, and your citizens, and this is, you know, maybe you all think it differently, but I can tell you the reality, is that your citizens believe that every major decision in your community, they are at the table and fully briefed. They assume that. And when the university goes to announce something, and in many cases, even a minor change in traffic due to the football game, or a minor change due to construction, the citizens of that community feel that the local government official understands, knows all of the reasons for it, they've looked at the various options and so forth. And the surprise of that is that I have found out more breaking news in my town at Kroger's than I have ever found out through an email from someone who should be emailing me. And it's not the idea of saying, well, geez, does every time we turn a stoplight on, we have to let the mayor know. No, but, it, but I can tell you, the communication that goes through on that level uh, really is important. And anything you can do to improve that. So uh, and let's use an example of, of just this convening today. Um, if we were having an event and we said, you know what, I think we've covered all our bases, we've invited this person and that person all. But you look around and there's probably 20 chairs empty. And if it was simply a matter of inviting the local town council and saying, these folks matter and they are kind of opinion leaders in our community, they're going to be at an event. They're going to be uh, uh, at, at the table. In most cases, it doesn't break the bank, it doesn't break the budget. Uh, they really, and I, I'll tell you as a local official for most of my adult life, you have a presumption that that's all it is, is banquets and red carpet openings and you're going around and stuff is happening all the time. It, it's more often than not that you're driving your car out with your wife going to dinner and there's this great big crowd of people over at the Fairmont State Community College in our town, and my wife will say, <laughs> it makes me feel bad, she'll say, what's going on there? And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> and when your wife kind of takes you down a peg and says, you know, you don't know what's happening, you're the mayor of Clarksburg, you don't know what they're doing, it, and just think the kind of that embarrassment that the next time the city has an event where they're going to be breaking ground on the new sewage treatment plant, by God, we're not bringing the university folks in. But just start thinking about those, those communication issues. When you start having, at a city event, you've invited the, the engineering, uh, the dean of the engineering school with your local sewer plant. They may have no connection to it, but it, it's in their wheelhouse. It's in something they're interested in. If you're doing a new traffic study, even if the university's not intricately involved with it, having that representative from the university who can, will probably be influencing in their sphere of influence, just having them in the room, communicating. And I'll give you another little clue. If you have a banquet and you're worried about the budget and you invite every town council person, the mayor, the assistant director of public works and everything else, you'll be lucky to get two people show up that by and large, because we've created in some cases these gulfs, but in, in other cases because some people really view the university or the college as kind of the, not the enemy per se, but as those folks, there's not a lot of that collaboration. So when you start to find as, hey, Councilman Smith has come to some of our events, Councilman Jones, you start to kind of cultivate that, and I can tell you the day that you have the entire council uh, 
uh, and the mayor at one of the events. The day that you have staff folks out there uh, is the day that town-gown relationships start to improve. The same way, and, and let me throw out another maybe mystery to folks, um, uh, <laughs> and since uh, if you're involved with the city, don't answer this because you, you're, you're, you already know this, but it, folks that are not involved with the city, I'd like to raise your hands. How many have been to more than 10 city council meetings in their life? Okay. But obviously it's a smatter, it's not the entire group. I've been to over 1,000, and I can tell you, the average city council meeting, and I, I, I won't even embarrass you by saying how many enjoyed those city council meetings. <laughs> but when that occurs, you recognize that it, that the crowds at city councils are pretty slim. When someone shows up at a, at a city council meeting and they say, you know, we sit up at the council uh, desk and we look out in the audience and if we see someone that we don't recognize, we ask the city manager, who is that guy in that orange sweater and what does he want? Because we don't want to be blindsided under the public comment where someone's really giving us heck, you know, we can try and solve the problem before the meeting starts. But you realize that just that alone is a good opportunity where universities and colleges can come together with the communities. I had a young man, when I was working in Morgantown, had a young man come to my office and he said, Jim, you, you've been mayor and city council member. He said, I've got a master's in public administration. I'd really like to get into that world. So after 20 minutes of trying to convince him to not get into that world, he said, what could I do if I'd like to serve on a local city council? And I said, well, here's my advice. He said, now, you probably aren't going to take it. And very few people does this, but here's my advice to you. Uh, attend, like, the next four meetings, and don't miss one. Attend the next four meetings city council. And at every meeting, under the public comment, sign in and go up and say a few words, but don't complain about anything. Just say, hi, I'm John Smith, I'm a local university student, I have a passion, I have a master's in public administration, I just love what you all do as public servants, and I just wanted to say hi and sit down and stay throughout the meeting. So that was my advice to him. Four weeks later, and he, he was just adamant, Four weeks later, he comes back to my office. He said, Jim, that's the most amazing advice I've ever had. He said, I've gotten up four times and spoke and never asked for anything. He said, I've waited around at the end of the meeting and shook hands with the council people and the city manager, the assistant, and so forth. And he said, they just asked me to be on the planning commission. And I said, it is literally, I mean, and that is the state of, in a way, of democracy across the country. It's not, it's not such a high bar where people think, oh my gosh, you know, you just got to be this. But the idea of it is, is that most people that comes to city meetings come to complain. Most people come with an agenda. And my other point, and I know a lot of you that have attended 10 or more city council meetings, the reason in a lot of cases you're there is because they've sent you on behalf of the university to, call, you know, to kind of calm things down, to say, go there on the zoning request. And more than once, and, and this, I'm going to get close to closing here, so this will be the, if you want to mark down the most important thing I say today, this will be at least one of them, is that when you go to the council meeting and you walk in, get there a little bit early, and kind of do some small talk and talk to some folks. When you're, you go in and sign in to speak, uh, go at, the meeting opens, they do the pledge and the prayer and all of the different things that occur at a city council meeting. And then you look down and a lot of them have printed agendas and there's like 400 items, you know, the new sewage tracking meters, the new this and that. When you look in your items number 15, Stay for the entire meeting. Because in my career, I can almost count on one hand the people who have stayed for the entire meeting and came up after the meeting and said to me, Jim, 
I really have a lot of respect for you. I never dreamed, this is my first meeting or my 10th meeting, I never dreamed of all of the stuff you're involved with. And I was so interested when they talked about those sewer meters. Um, <laughs> and when I say I could count on one hand, I could also count on that same hand the five people that have had the most successful relationships with the city during my entire tenure. And it's people that care a little bit about what else goes on other than just your mission of going to those meetings. And you create that sort of thing where, and I guarantee you, the council members, the mayor, when they go back and talk among themselves, they'll say, I really like that Pete Haga. I don't know why, but I really like him. And the next time that they come, and, and I had a young lady that was looking, uh, she was our new arts director in town. And she taught me something that was the second most important point. She said, uh, she came to council one night, I'd never met her. She said, my name's Lisa Starcher, I'm the new director of the Arts Center in town. And I just wanted to come and introduce myself to the city council. And she didn't ask us for anything. She said, you know, I'm just thrilled to be in town and I think the arts are really gonna take hold in, in Clarksburg. So she sat down, stayed the entire meeting, walked up, passed us an invitation that she was holding in her apartment, pretty modest apartment in town, said, I'm gonna have a little wine and cheese thing and I'd really like for you to come and pass it out. The very next meeting, Lisa came and asked for a contribution to the Harrison County Arts Center. The city had not contributed to the Arts Center in my entire tenure. Lisa walked out of the second meeting she came to with a $15,000 commitment in our town, which is a pretty significant commitment for the arts, and she became one of the people that we always consulted with, no matter who came, we'd say, what does Lisa think about this? So you recognize it's not a huge undertaking, and when you all go back to your communities, you're gonna see, geez, there's some things here that if I just tweak it, if I just do the little extra, if I educate some of the other folks who seem to be having such huge challenges, and also that thing of just saying to the, that the city has a responsibility also. If you're having an event, I've judged art competitions, landscape architectures, uh, a lot of projects throughout the community where they ask me to participate as a judge. When you do it, you start that link of a town-gown relationship that that person sitting on council who judges the landscape architect competition will generally be supportive of the university in town. When you're totally kind of divorced from the university, it's tough to find friends, and you can't make a 10 minutes before the meeting starts. So in closing, I just uh, I want to say to you, the really the message, and I hope I've shared some kind of a a look behind the curtain in a way of what occurs out there. Uh, the folks in this room, by and large, get it. You're, you're doing fine, but you can do better. Uh, you can tweak what you're doing and really start seeing some unbelievable benefits out of this. But the other thing that I'd make the pitch to you, and I, they're not, nobody asked me to do this. When this room is three times as full, we'll have three times the collaboration, We'll have three times the links out in the communities. You'll have people who are having experiences where they're just, they've reinvented the wheel. And that'll only happen if this organization grows. If we're able to link in digitally now, we have so many ideas through the website and all, that there's no sense in spending huge amount of resources finding something else that someone else has already tried. And I think that's the value of why we're here today. I, I learn as much as anyone in this room. I also recognize that when I go home, uh, if there was a person from one city here, just one person, your task when you go back is to get your governing body together, get the university folks that are affiliated in terms of working with town gown relations and just share with them some of the stuff you've learned. Share with them the ITGA as an organization. And what they'll start to find, I think, is that they'll say, you know what, this really was a value. This is something that I can't really get anywhere else. And when this starts to percolate, and this is the big grand message, when this starts to work, 
then every city in America starts to grow because what I recommend to folks that if you don't have a university or college in your town, act like you do. Because when you start to think that one professor coming 50 miles down the road and representing your university in some small town in America, you're bringing to them what they cannot get in any other way. And when you're able to bring those messages out, it strengthens all of us. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's really a thrill for me, and knowing the folks in this room are really the people that can make it happen. So thank you very much, and I think the, the agenda is certainly power-packed, so you'll have plenty more to do today and the following days. Thank you very much.